Well, we started with, I'm going to give a quick summary over the three messages. The first one that we looked at together was, why did God create us? We spent a lot of time under that focus, why did God create us? But the short answer is he created us to have a relationship with us or with him, and he created us for his glory. Those two are the quick summaries of why did God create us. He created us, you could say, because he wanted to. He created us to have a relationship with him, and he created us because it glorifies his name to do so. Uh, That was the first first message. The second message, what is the importance of that relationship? Now, today, we're going to eventually get to 1 Peter, but the second question was, what is the importance of the relationship? And that importance is bound to this. The importance of this relationship is that Christ died for you to buy you back to himself. So the importance of the relationship is magnified by the fact that Jesus put on flesh and foreordained before the world began, knew the circumstance that we would be in, and he came for you. Now, he came to provide an opportunity for you to have a relationship with him. So we often know John 3.16. Again, I'm just throwing this in for the message as a, as a reference. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it goes on to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, what? Yeah, so there is this might be saved. So this opportunity is there for all of the world, and the question comes down to you, will you come into that relationship? So in 2 Corinthians 5, I'm going to give uh, just a handful of verses that bring into summary. Verse 14, would you read verse 14 and 15 out loud with me? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, reading with me now. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now, time out there, and just a note in my my notes, because it's a large point for today, in our relationship, as you're going to see this borne out, God... And we took time to give several verses that that dealt with this last week. But this bolded idea in verse 15, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Instead, when we come to know Christ, he brings us into a relationship with him where we are living with him, and and this will be borne out in our series, uh, but continually. All the time. Now read in verses 18 through 21, if you would. For sake of time, I'm going to read it for us. 2 Corinthians 5, just a few verses down. Verses 18 through 21, and I'll read for us. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself. This was the focus last week. By Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You'll remember that last week we focused on the word reconcile and to be reconciled, and it is literally to be bought back, to pay a price for. To exchange coins was actually um, a way that this was lived out. Verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling, buying back the world unto himself, not imputing or imparting or applying their trespasses, we would know as sins, deviances from God, trespasses against him, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us who know him as Savior, unto us the word of reconciliation. So the believer now goes into life all of us having this ministry of a declarative of the work of reconciliation that is offered to the world. Going on in verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. And here's the entreaty. We pray you, I beg for you in Christ's stead. He says, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Further, for he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, 
Now listen to this, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, we didn't take, I'm not taking a lot of time this morning, but re- reference this, this relationship. It's all based on Jesus, all based on Jesus, all based on Jesus. He did it. He calls us. He draws us. He invites us. He pays the price. And it's only found, as it says in this last part of the, the verse, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right. So today, I, I'm going to tell you that today's passage is largely built in uh, a continuation, at least in part of that theme, that, and you'll see it in First Peter. So at this point, I wanna, we're going to get to First Peter in just a second, where we're going to read about reconciliation, but a few statements in, in the nature of the title today. What is the nature of relationship with God? I'm going to argue this morning that the nature <clears throat> of that relationship is a reflection It's a reflection of God in you. So the nature of the relationship is that when we are born into the family of God, we begin to take on a fashioning after Christ. There is what we call a sanctification, what the Bible calls a sanctification work that God is doing in all of his children to transform us more and more in a daily fashion to be not only followers of Christ, but fashioned after him. Now, why would this be true? Well, best back in 2 Corinthians 5, you have that phrase that they which live should not henceforth, for from now on, live unto themselves. Why? Because the Lord has come not only to save you, but can you understand this and, and accept this terminology? He has come to wholly embrace you, and I'd say it a step further, own you completely. God is interested in everything about your life and not just interested as if paying, you know, paying attention to, to you know, to what you're doing, but he's interested. It, it, it has some <clears throat> semblance to me texting my son the other day. He's, he's now got a, got a job uh, in Wisconsin where he's trying to help pay for his school and I was asking him all kinds of questions, and, and I got a little bit of the flavor back from him. It's like, why are you asking all these questions? <laughs> and I said, honest, and this, this is just the sentiment. I'm, I'm, I'm asking simply because I'm interested, simply because I care. And that's how God is about your life. <clears throat> God actually cares about you. And that's going to be laid out all throughout this series, so you'll hear it again. But it is a reflection, not only this relationship is not only a reflection of your relationship with him, but it's actually a reflection of him. Okay, so this relationship is a reflection of God and your being connected to him. Now, I want to remind us of a few things as we step into this, and uh, I'll just give you a couple points under this as we begin. Remember, first of all, we are created in his image. You were created, you were created in the image of God. A couple of verses, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, you Walking this planet, bear the image of God, okay? So he creates you after his image. Now, that's a New Testament theme that has eternal significance because not only were we created in his image, but we see later on that we are also not only being conformed, but we will ultimately be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, for this, it would be helpful probably if you turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and then we're going to look at a couple other verses in a couple other books as well. Romans 8, you know this passage well, many of you. For many, the most comforting passage in Scripture is Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, we often look at the front part of that, and we look at it in the time of trouble saying, hey, everything's going to work out, it's going to work out, it's going to work out, it'll be okay. Yes, it will be okay. It will. But for the believer, the reason it's going to be okay is because we ultimately are going to be in glory. That's what Romans 8 is all about. So the reason it's going to be okay, 
It's because we're made not to live in this place forever. We're made particularly for those who know Christ as your savior. You are made to be with him forever in heaven. Okay? So Romans 8.29 is the verse that follows. And we know that all things work together for good. All right, Romans 8.29. Read it out loud with me. Romans 8.29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Just as God made each one of us physically in his image, and we bear the image of the glory of God, the child of God is being changed to be fashioned after the person of Jesus Christ. Every one of us. Now, I got a question for you. How much do you look like Jesus? Is that a sobering question, by the way? So I, I think something that all of us need to recognize, you've heard this phrase, I hope, before. You may be the only Christian somebody ever knows. If that was the case, what would their opinion of Christianity be? If these seem heavy to you, they seem heavy to me. Um, and I own the fact that, yeah, boy, is there a responsibility to manifest Christ. Now, I don't want to get lost in the weeds here. Yes, that's true. It's true that we have a responsibility to manifest Christ. But what I want to challenge you with really is before the idea, before the idea that we need to manifest Christ to the world, I want to lay down the foundation that we are created in the image of God and we are going to be conformed to his image. Doctrinally, it is so. That when he saved us, he saved you to change your life to be in a relationship with him. All of it. So let me ask you, is there a difference in your life since you've come to know Christ? We talked about this in my Sunday school class. I got saved when I was 15. You know, I didn't really have to have a message to tell me to stop swearing. I didn't have to have it. The Holy Spirit made me very aware of that very quickly. The Lord didn't have to tell me uh, specifically, like I didn't have to have a message on, on this, that, and the other about what was supposed to be changed in my life. The Holy Spirit began that work. And, and can, can we all recognize this? I think this is important doctrinally. Sometimes we come to church and we look at people and we see the outside and we, and we think, that person's got it all together. I can't wait in my life to where I can grow and be mature like them. Let's, let's be frank. We all need growth. And we're all still being changed. Not a one of us is perfect. Okay? So God, purpose, I love this. Okay, here, this is what, I have to say, this is why I like being a preacher. I get to come in front of you and tell you what God has already said and which you know. And in my mind, I get to be a cheerleader for the truth of God. I think, I, think that's, I think that's a fun thing. And here's what I love about it. God's word is true. His word is powerful. And what he says is he's made you to be conformed to the image of Christ. God is going to do that in your life. Okay? Now let's look at another passage and recognize that this, this work of what I've referenced already as sanctification is a, is a progressive work. There is a doctrinal sense as well where it's very true that it's a positional work that God has done. In other words, we may be progressing in our sanctification, but God sees us as already completely sanctified. Now, there's two sides to that coin, but let's look at that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> now, listen to this conformity that God is doing, Okay. And, and here's the importance of this. You have to reconcile this to be so in your life. In other words, God has said a truth. You need to be surrendered to that truth. You have to make that decision. Nobody can make it for you. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 47 through 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 through 49. The first man, speaking of Adam here, is of the earth, earthy. In other words, though he's made in the image of God, he still bears that earthiness to him. The second man is the Lord from heaven, speaking of Christ. And as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And what does that simply mean? 
This whole earth is sin cursed. And all the earth bears the witness of that curse. All that are in the earth bear that witness. Everything that's in the earth bears that witness. There is nothing that is made on this planet or even outside of this planet that is not experiencing the um, degrading work of the sin curse. Okay? So as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we, now this is where he's not talking, you know, if, you, or if you're confused thinking that in verse 48 he's talking about angels or, think, he's not. He's talking about us as you read in verse 49. And as we have borne and do bear the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the what? So if you were to continue to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, guess what it talks about? It talks about this mortal putting on immortality. It talks about us being changed and given a glorified body to where when we are in heaven, I'm just going to tell you, it's better than we can imagine, but that's what 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about, okay? But as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also or shall also bear the image of the heavenly. 1 John chapter 3, our last passage before we get into 1 Peter. Okay, so what is the nature of this relationship? It is a reflection. God created us in his image. God is conforming us to the image of Christ. 1 John 3, 1 through 3, our last passage on this conformity. 1 John 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Now listen to this. What kind of love did he share? That we should be called the what? Now, don't let that phrase lose you. The sons of God. All right? Do you hear relationship? Do you hear relationship? I know it's a doctrinal point to make, and people might argue with this, but I cringe a little bit when when somebody says, we're all the children of God. I cringe a little bit. Let me tell you why. First of all, there's room for it in this, in this sense. God, to his glory, and will praise him just this way, he made every one of us. Amen? So we don't have to think of, you know, wondering when did this, you know, burp in history happen where out of all these gases and, and, and all this stuff that somehow, here we are today. We are are made by God, we give God glory and affirming that truth, but everyone is not a child of God. You have life from God, but you're only a child of God upon believing in Christ. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, speaking of Christ, to them gave he power, and the word power there means the authority or the right, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to be called the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You want to be a child of God? You have to come into a relationship with him. But a relationship with him is a father-child relationship. It is a relationship where we become his children. Therefore, in 1 John 3, the end of verse 1, therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And verse 3, and every man, every person that has this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure, this is the work of God in conforming his children after his image. So the nature of this relationship is that it is a reflection. Now, a time out here as we go to 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to, I'm going to spend some time in, in 1 Peter, but I'm going to give some illustration 
in this passage, I'm going to hold off just for a moment and lay the case out as we get a little further into 1 Peter 1. But you've got to hang on to this relationship of a child of God. Okay, so everybody with me? Everybody is not a child of God, but you can be. So this morning, the invitation would go out as any Sunday we would hope it to go out. If you want a relationship with God, you've got to come to Christ. And specifically, you have to come into a relationship where you have received him as your savior, a decision you must make. Okay? If you don't make that decision to submit and surrender to Christ as your savior, the Bible clearly says you're not his child, you are not in a relationship with him, and the ultimate consequence of not being in that relationship is coming to stand before him after death at the great white throne judgment. There is a departing of everyone who he did not know and did not know him, where he, they depart into what the Bible calls the everlasting lake of fire. He came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Where you sit this morning, being in church is not going to get you to heaven. You've got to come to Christ. All right. But 1 Peter chapter 1 is a passage that's built on comforting God's people who are under persecution. God's people in this passage are referenced as the elect of God who are suffering But in that suffering, he's going to direct their minds to heaven. He's going to direct their minds to the hope that lies before us, that we have an inheritance in heaven that does not fade away. And and he goes further in that passage towards, I'm going to say verses 9 through 12, where he references the Old Testament prophets, where they were looking forward to look into those things and wondered about things. But here we are today looking back. And here's the point. We haven't seen Christ physically. If we know him, we know him by faith. But in verse 13 and following, built on this relationship of knowing Christ, there's some arguments that are going to be made about the reflection of, re- of your relationship that you have with Christ. So verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. The girding up the loins of your mind, the loins were typically envisioned as a garment that would have been gathered up so that, and and yes, men wore these things, these kind of flowing garments, they would gather them up, and, and when they were trying to move quickly, they would gather them up so they could run. It was a preparation of being ready. And here's what God is saying to you, gird up the loins of your mind, prepare yourself, be sober. And hope to the end. Now what is to the end? To the end of our lives. And to the coming of Christ. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a reflection of the fact that if you know Christ, you are saved. And when he comes back, he's going to take you to be in glory with him. And we're looking forward to that. And that hope is what encourages us. Now, verse 14, you're going to start to see some application about the life of the believer. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. And now would you read verses 15 and 16 out loud with me. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. All right, we got to do a little bit of logistics here. At the end of 1 John 3, that I read to you, verses 1 through 3, there is a statement there. He says, every man that has this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. The word for pure, pure is hagnos, and it is based off of the root word hagios. I'm going to tell you why that matters. Hagnos is translated appropriately, 1 John 3, appropriately defined as pure, okay? So applicationally, hagnos, based on the word hagios, which we're going to see here in just a moment, applicationally for us, it means that believers are going through this life where God is purifying you. And specifically, 
This would re reference believers who you know Christ, but now God is purifying you and cleaning you up and making you more to look like Jesus every day. So I got a question. Do you need that work? Uh, easier question. Does your, does your husband need that work? <laughs> Do your children need that work? Kids, your parents don't need this, I know. Um, so this word hagnos is based on hagios, which you read in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. It's going to bear out here in just a moment, okay? So, all right. This passage then says that there are applications of life in the child of God where there is a change in who we are because we have that relationship. And God is the one who's working out that change. And again, it's positional, but it's also progressive. We are declared by God to be holy when we know Christ. So he's declared you, it's done. And again, go back and read Romans 8 and you'll see. It's, it's a finished work. He sees us as already in heaven, okay? But there's a progressive work of clean, cleaning and sanctification. What we reference here is hognos at the end of 1 John 3. But here in 1 Peter 1, hagios. And that word is holy. And I think it's not, you know, it's easily seen. You don't need a, you know, a thundering preacher to make it clear. But it's, it's, it's very clear. But as he which hath called you is holy, so who is the one that's called you? But as he which hath called you, who's called you? You can say Christ, God, and the Holy Spirit here as well. As he with his, which hath called you is holy, what's he make, what argument does he make? I'm making you say it. So who's supposed to be holy? I'm going to say it again. Who's supposed to be holy? You're squirming on me. Cut it out. I'm with you. It's right in the seat where you are. Who's supposed to be holy? You. Now don't get discouraged and don't get lost. You might look at yourself and say, but I'm not. You have every confidence in knowing that if God has saved you, he's going to work this in your life. He is. It's what he does, and he's good at it. Now, are you stubborn? Are you stubborn? No. <laughs> okay. Because it is written, now this is a declarative of scripture, because it is written, be ye holy, for I, he says of himself, am holy. All right. So I'm going to take you back to this concept of sonship, this concept of being a child of God. Is it clear this morning that you need to be a child of God? Scriptures make that clear. And to be a child of God means to be saved, okay? Once you are saved, you become his child and he's doing a work in you. But here's what I want to reference for you. When you look at the word here, we most often think of holiness and not inappropriately so. We often think of holiness as being set apart, consecration. We look at it as, and this is fair, it, when you are holy, <clears throat> it is why I've used the word sanctified as well. It's where God takes something that is holy and he dedicates it to himself. You see this picture of holiness most often in the temple where God references the items that are in the temple and why, did it, why it was sacrilege to defile the temple by taking that which was holy and giving it over to that which was profane or earthy, okay? Okay. And God was very serious about that concept, okay? So it is true that holiness does have this sense of consecration, this idea of you are set apart as an identified child of God. It does mean that, but I want to broaden your understanding of hagios. And if you look at the definition of hagios, if you were to type in a 
some type of a lexicon or a thesaurus or, or, or a sun study tool, hagios, in Strong's Concordance, I believe it's number 40. If you were to look at that word, you're going to go throughout, especially your Old Testament, because it's a Greek word in the Old, in New Testament. You're going to look and you're going to see holy, 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 and all these verses that say holy. Do you know what the other word is? There's another word that's strongly linked to this word hagios, translated as such all throughout your New Testament. You know what that word is? Some of your versions may have it, but it means saints. It's translated as saints. In other words, hagios is an identifier. Holiness is an identifier. The word hagios is most often translated holy, is translated saints many times. Can you tolerate this with me? Let's just take a look at a couple of them. Philippians chapter 4, and just a couple of pages after that, Colossians 1. Okay? Philippians chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 4, verses 21 22, you're looking at the end of Philippians. And Paul is giving a, a salutation here or a departing, you know, this kind of farewell. But in Philippians chapter 4, verses 21 and 22, if you'll look at that with me, I'll read it for us. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Where is the word hagias in verse 21 and 22? Salute every Hagias. All the, verse 22, all the Hagias. All the holy, all the saints salute you. Colossians chapter 1, just another maybe page over, if that. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word is found where? To the saints, Hagias. All right, so so that's what I want you to catch. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 is using that same word. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So Hagias is a reference of the pure character of God, the sinless character of God, when often we talk about the most identifying factor uh, doctrinally of who God is. This is arguable. But when you talk about the nature of who God is, he is identified as holy. Okay? And appropriately so. He himself is the set apart one, okay? And God has set us apart. And he's identified us in translation here as the Hagias who are the saints. All right. So we understand then that we have this transformation that happens in the life of the believer when you become a child of God. So today, we have referenced that there was a birth in the church family. Chris and Elizabeth Monet have now had their first child, their daughter, who's named Emrin Ann Monet. Now, I I just have to admit now, again, I don't know if you guys can even do this on your camera. You don't have to, but on the church camera out there for online. But I pulled this up the other day, and I hope I can find it real quickly. Maybe I can. Cynthia, you got this through a text as well, right? I think you got a text of when Emron was born. I know you can't see real well out there, but here's this little beautiful baby. I think she has a little bit of that turtle look to her where she's sticking her head up like this. It's just, just just the cutest thing, right? I am not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I love your babies when you have your babies, but I am deficient in this way. I do not know how you people come up to a brand new baby and you look at that baby and you say, oh, she looks like whatever. It looks like a baby. 
But you're like, oh, she looks just like mom. Oh, she's got, oh, she's got her dad's nose. <laughs> Squished flat on her. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? But what is weird is give me time. And what I mean by time, here's what's weird. Now, I don't know who the oldest saint in this room is today. I got a guess, but I'm not going to say. But if you were to take a picture of them and then go back in time and look at them in their 60s and then their 50s and their 40s, and you take them all the way back to that little picture where they're sitting on the cloth in their little outfit as a baby lying on a mat. If you were to take them back to that picture, can you see the resemblance? Yes. It's weird. When I was in college, I did an in-depth study on holiness. And this is what's interesting about holiness. Holiness is a reflection of God. In other words, a practical definition of holiness is simply to reflect God like a mirror reflects your image. We see this in the world all around us because we recognize and we know this to be true. As kids grow, you begin to see, oh, that's a sterling. Oh, that's a buyer's. Oh, because there are 32 of, no, anyway, there's a, um, <clears throat> and your best guess is just to name one of those families, right? But you begin to see, Elizabeth, you see little William. You see, you begin to see family. So weird is it that sometimes you can see the grandparents. Okay? So I'm going to give this illustration. Uh, some of you know the story of my life and that my paternal father and I were separated for many years. And there came a time when I was, I, I don't remember all the specific, I, I remember now. So I got a half brother. So same dad, but different moms, okay? And I had never seen him. His name is Ben. Ben and I are, uh, we're, we're so similar. At a very young age, we were very manly, <laughs> very big. My half-brother, Ben, at 13, was 6'4", 5", and 300 pounds. And I'd never met him. I'd heard about him. I don't know, I think I was 21. And, and the way it worked out was when I, I met, I was gonna go see my dad. I didn't know that Ben was gonna be there that I remember. But when you came to my grandparents' house, they had a walk-in basement and then they had stairs that would lead up to what was the living room. It was somewhat evening, a little bit, uh, well, it was dark outside, but lights on in the basement. So when I walked in, the door was open at the top of the stairs. And at the top of the stairs, there was a couch up against the wall where seated was Ben. And I could see Ben looking down the stairs towards me. But as I walked in and began to walk up the stairs, Ben, his, his, his face said everything. His jaw dropped. He looks down at me. He looks across the room, and I can't see across the room. He looks down at me, and he looks across the room, and he just, he's like shocked. And the reason is, even though my dad and I had not spent those growing up years together, I look incredibly similar to my dad through, through just the nature of being his child. My mother used to say, it is uncanny now, my parents divorced when I was five, so dad was not around. But she said, it's uncanny in your teenage years. She said, you would laugh and I hear your father. She says, you walk like him. Now, honestly, sometimes, I don't know if you know this, many times the way we walk, it, it can be even very much developed by who you're around. But somehow, by God's genetic design, of course, as, as family, we bear the image of family. And so what that meant is when Ben was looking at me, he absolutely saw my dad. 
If you were to take, and by the way, remember when that face app came out of aging yourself? Okay? Don't do that. It's not pretty. <laughs> and if you did the face app and you didn't change at all, <laughs> I'll leave it alone, okay? If you were to take my life, and it's always been this way, put it, put it 20 years ahead, it's like my dad and I, except for the generational hairstyle changes, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, my dad, that generation, you guys were greasing your hair, white t-shirts rolled up, all that, yeah. That's, except for that, my dad and I are almost, I mean, it's, it's uncanny, you're like almost twins. So I bear the image of my father. I, I look like him. My mannerisms are often like him. This is exactly the application of holiness. That's exactly what it means. It means that you bear the image of your heavenly father. That you bear the image of your savior. And when you look through the passage in 1 Peter 1, you see it bearing out as God works this change in us. So he's just got done saying, verse 14 and 15, but as he which has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. And by the way, I don't take this for granted. Not everybody knows the word conversation in this passage is talking about manner of life, not just the way we speak, okay? Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Verse 17, 1 Peter chapter one, if you need to get back there. 1 Peter one, verse 17. So applicationally, bearing his image, the Lord is now going to take us to what looking or being a child of God looks like and how it manifests in the life of a believer. So verse 17, and if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now what do you learn in that verse? In part, you learn for every believer, doctrinally, you need to be oriented to this fact. You are a sojourner. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I lose the words there. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, uh, <laughs> See, I had to take a great moment and ruin it, right? Okay. Sorry, honey. <laughs> My wife's over there like, oh, what's he do? <laughs> You're a sojourner, verse 18. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed. Now, this is what tied it to last week's verse, or last week's passage. You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your empty conversation, Receive by tradition from your fathers. Read verse 19 out loud. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, you were bought by the blood of Christ. There is no greater price that can be paid to redeem your soul than God putting on flesh and dying for you a people that would never be worthy, a people that would never deserve it, a people that when he saves us has to fight with us to surrender. And yet he saves us anyway. Verse 20, knowing the plan of God who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. You come back to this. You want to know that you're believing in the right thing. You have the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The one who has power over life and death. 
Verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls, in other words, you have been cleansed, you've been saved by faith, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit. Now it goes further, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. In other words, a natural outworking of hagias, a natural outworking of this purification is that God has called his children to love each other purposefully, intentionally, deeply, wholly. And what I mean by that is completely. This manifests who we are as believers. So that you love one another, verse 22, with a pure heart how? All right, sometimes. Now, that's not the purpose of this message to, to speak to this avenue, but do messages need to be taught to the church of God to stop quarreling and start loving? To stop bickering and picking over each other's faults and love each other. You want to look like Jesus, love like Jesus loves you. You want to look like Jesus, love like Jesus loves you. Now, it says a pure heart fervently. In other words, we strain at this. We work hard at this. Now, again, all this relationship bound in this again, bound in this truth. Verse 23, here you have it. Being born again. What's he arguing here? He's arguing your child relationship to the father. He's arguing the relationship, which is a holy relationship, of family. Born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now listen to this, and we're almost done. For all flesh is as what? Now what does that mean? You know what I saw yesterday? I did not expect to see. I saw people cutting grass. <laughs> it was our subdivision. I was driving on, and they were cutting the grass for us. So I was driving, I'm like, not me. <laughs> cutting grass. <laughs> for all flesh is as grass. What does that mean? Can we agree? Temporary? Hello? You are not made to live on this planet forever in this frame. God is going to change this frame to be fashioned after him. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass. Now flowers are pretty. But do they lose it at some point? Yes. Don't go home and look at old pictures of yourself. <laughs> at least when you get to my age, don't do that. All the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers. And the flower thereof falleth away. Listen to this. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Understand that every moment we're in glory as a child of God, it will be because his promise never ends. Never. When God said he would give you eternal life, he meant it. When he said in the gospel of John, when Christ said that he goes to prepare a place for us to where he is, we may be also, he meant it. Our message time is really <laughs> relatively done. The application, I think you need to sort out and needs to linger for you. But here's the question. Why are you living your life? Why are you doing what you do? To live it biblically I think means to thank God every day for all of his blessings. 
Thank God for his provision. Thank God for his, thank, and if you read back in 1 Peter 1, thank God for the trials. It says, you know, in 1 Peter 1, it says that the trials are, are, are more valuable, I think it says, than gold. Because they have a working and manifesting and developing your faith. But all of this is the idea that God wants you to walk with him because you're made in his image and you're going to be fashioned after his image and you've got a future and all that future is because of Christ. Now, I'm thankful. I I, I, I want to say it resoundingly and with authority. I am thankful for all that God has for me in my future because of relationship with him. But can I say it this way too? I'm thankful right now. I'm thankful right now what it means to be a child of God. I'm thankful for his help every day. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit who's always there. I'm thankful for the fact that he hasn't given up on me and the fact that I know I need change and I know that he's the one doing it. And I'm thankful for his power that can get it done. I'm thankful for the fact that I need him. I'm thankful for the fact that I'm gonna need him tomorrow. And I'm thankful for the fact that he's gonna be there tomorrow and he'll be there tomorrow either by me walking with him and the Holy Spirit indwelling or he'll be there tomorrow when he comes and takes us home to glory. We, I, I'm thankful for a relationship with Christ. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, and I'm, I'm going to open the door slightly. In our future, we're going to be talking about other relationships. This begins the understanding of there is no relationship like the relationship you can have with God. None. And that's going to be a very important truth in the days ahead. So this morning, part three of relationships, what is the nature of a relationship with God? It is a reflection. You reflect his image by the nature of being a human being. But as a child of God, you're a reflection of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And God's not done with you. He's still working on you. Surrender to that working and know this. God is faithful and walking with him will never bring you sorrow. Doesn't mean that all of life will be easy. But he will give you joy even in the midst of sorrow when you walk with him. So walk with him.